know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, then your face is surely shown. And if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, stop your feet. If you're happy and you know it, stop your feet. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show. And if you're happy and you know it, stop your feet. If you're happy and you know it, shout amen. Amen. Good to see everyone here tonight. Thank you, ladies, for another wonderful meal, and it's great to have fellowship and food on a Wednesday night. Nice that we can have uh, weather to do so. We're grateful that Fran and Russ are with us again tonight. We look forward to class time in just a few minutes. Uh, just some updates on some folks. Uh, uh, we want to do make sure we do all we can to encourage Leah and Seth as they were both baptized at camp last week. So. We rejoice with them and their families. Uh, Larry says uh, Ernie Dickens got some favorable news and they uh, can tell that his tumors are shrinking, so we're grateful for that. 
Stacy is making slow but sure progress. She still remains at ProMedica Rehab in Perrysburg. Pam Fisher continues to do well with her therapy. Uh, Debbie Hyman remains at St. Anne's Hospital and she's probably going to go to rehab soon. Uh, those that continue to need prayers, uh, Larry Baker, uh, Deb Barker, uh, doing well, adjusting to the cast on her, on her arm. Robert Bias, Mary Clucky. Uh, any updates on Jim? Uh, Bob, is he doing any better? Jim? Okay. I know sometimes we can uh, put people on the list and they get better and we don't know about it. But continue praying for Jim. Uh, also, Dave Durr is at home following a bout with pneumonia, so we want to be praying for uh, Dave that uh, he continues to get well. Uh, Jamie, uh, Dorothy Duvall, Janice Holt. Uh, Fran Langlois is in uh, St. Charles with COVID. And it's my understanding that they probably will be taking her gallbladder out uh, sometime if they have not already. Uh, she's in isolation, so basically John can't see her. So pray for John and Fran as they go through a, a difficult time in their lives. Uh, Jasper Lucas, Mary Noble. Talk to Mary Noble uh, this afternoon, a couple hours ago. She sounded... Uh, uh, very encouraged in her voice uh, that I had not heard in a long time. So uh, hopefully prayers are being uh, answered there and continue to do what you can to encourage uh, Mary. Uh, Felicia Neal, Joy Parker, Gwen Schmidt uh, probably still has another week or so before she's able to be mobile and drive. And Dave and Connie Street are still having some issues. So want to be praying for them. And uh, uh, also, uh, just recently, what a wonderful milestone that Dave and Luann and Bob and Laura recently celebrated 50 years of marriage. In today's uh, world, that is quite the accomplishment, and I'm so uh, grateful for these couples and what they have meant to their families and also to the church as well. Uh, did I miss anybody, or do we have additional announcements. I had a pen before I started, but I've somehow lost it, so I'll have to try to remember that, and that's a dangerous thing for me to do. But any other? Did I miss anybody? Okay. Writer family? Okay. All right. Josh? Andrew and Laura? Andrew and Laura? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, anybody else? Yes, Dean. Okay. Okay. I believe also, uh, I can't remember the name. Uh, Carrie might be able to help me. Um, yes. Ryan Mahaffey. Okay. Ryan, the Mahaffey family, Becky's close friend that we were praying for. Um, okay. Any others? Did I miss anybody? All right, let's pray together. God, it's just so good to be here on a Wednesday night. It's so good to be here, and thank you for summertime, Lord. Thank you for the uh, fact that we can get out and enjoy the seasons. Thank you, Father, for the uh, seeds that were planted at camp last week. We're grateful for the fruit that uh, uh, and the Leah and Seth, as they decided to put on Christ. We pray, Father, that uh, many, many seeds were planted and perhaps others will uh, be baptized as well. Father, we're just uh, mindful of so many that uh, need your caring hand. Pray for Brother Dave as he is uh, 
getting over pneumonia. Pray that you'll be with him and help him. Uh, pray that uh, you'll be with Fran as uh, she's very possibly in surgery soon, that all may go well, and that uh, John will be able to see her soon. Pray for uh, Elsie as she has pneumonia. We pray that uh, uh, she will be able to get over that soon and that her body will be able to fight that. We pray for uh, the Reitz family. Pray that you'll be with them in the unexpected loss. Uh, pray that you'll be with Becky's friend, uh, Ryan Mahaffey, and their family and bless them. And Father, we have so many others that are sick and that need your uh, healing hand. Uh, we also want to remember uh, uh, Debbie as she is in uh, St. Anne's. And Father, she's had uh, quite the struggle these last couple of months. And bless her, help her to turn a corner and be with Goldie and Cindy as they minister to her. Pro Father, we pray that you'll be with Ernie Dickens. We're grateful for the good news there that uh, his cancer, is, uh, the tumors are shrinking. We pray that that will continue to be the case. And we pray that... Uh, we might say or do something to encourage him, Father. Uh, thankful, Father, for uh, everything you do for us. We pray that you can be, continue to be with Stacy and Pam, with Larry uh, Baker, uh, Deb Barker, Robert. We just pray that uh, his test uh, coming up soon will come out okay. Uh, continue to pray for uh, Fran and be with her and Jasper Lucas and Mary Noble. Pray that you'll continue to be with Mary and keep her out of pain. Uh, be with Joy Parker and, and uh, give her some happiness in her life, uh, given the situation that she's in, and help us to do all we can to encourage her. Uh, pray for Dave and Connie Street as they have struggled with various medical issues the last couple months. Bless them and, and be with them, Father. And Father, we're just thankful for the encouragement that we had Sunday and all the visitors that we had. and. Again, Father, we're grateful for uh, what camp does for the spiritual welfare of our youngsters, and we pray, Father, that that, that may continue uh, the rest of the year, that they are excited about you and help those of us who are older to encourage the younger ones. Thank you for our time together tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Andy, we're going to skip Be Thou My Vision, so you know. We will glorify. <clears throat> we will glorify.
you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Yes, sir, absolutely. Appreciate it. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Thank you. Make sure you get one of these lessons. We'll make sure that uh, we're on the same page in this series. Uh, I just wanted to announce that three weeks from tonight, you won't see me anymore. I mean, not forever, Lord willing, but we've got two more weeks and that's it. So I've really enjoyed being with you during this series, and I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Uh, I did want to say, you know, there are some things that uh, I wanted to share with you just to give you an idea of some things that you might need to know about. Um, many of you haven't seen my daughter and my son says Heather was 14 and Russell was 10, I think, Fran, when we moved from here. And so uh, they've grown up and this is a picture of my grandson Drew and my daughter Heather. And that was either last, I think that was the Christmas before and this is a picture of my son Russell and his wife Marie, and that is from last Christmas. So I tried to, oh, thank you. Uh, and so, as you can see, he loves ugly sweaters. He's wearing a piece of pizza there. Um, and he, he always, he's a clown anyway. But uh, I'm excited tonight because um, we get to see these and uh, this, this is a couple of boys, uh, twins actually, Mauricio and Diego. Uh, I baptized them in the pool behind the church. The parsonage is behind the church and they have a pool in Naples. So I got to baptize these two. The baptismal uh, was under construction so we took them out back in the pool. And let me tell you, it wasn't heated. It was cold. Uh, you can't see us. Uh, it was really cold. But anyway, uh, I wanted you to share that with you because these two young men were in a class like this that I was teaching, and they realized, you know, their baptism was something that they were kind of forced into. Um, as I shared with you, one of the other men that I baptized uh, this past, about three or four months ago, uh, Ernesto, he told me that his mom and dad took him down to the river and baptized, forced him into the water and baptized him. Now, Kennedy, I don't think you were forced, were you? Okay, did Billy hold you under a little longer? A <laughs> little bit? She says a little bit. We'll talk to Billy about that, okay? Uh, but you know, they, they realized Mauricio and Diego, they realized that uh, their baptism, they didn't know what they were doing. And so they wanted to be rebaptized. And they're, they're a couple of young, great kids. I call them kids, they're probably 25, but uh, it, the Lord works when you study the scripture because the Bible is sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews chapter four. And so the power's in the word, isn't it? So all we have to do is expose people to the power of the word, and that's where it takes place. That's why I I seem to be amazed, but I shouldn't be, when somebody comes to the Lord or comes to worship and visits with us. We had a couple that were visiting with us uh, last Sunday. His name was Justin, and her name was Cheyenne, and I invited them to a Bible study on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, and it's people like that, that there are people out there searching. And every week, you know, we get, we probably have 150 in attendance and we get visitors every week. And some people are walking out the door with never being asked to study scriptures, never been invited to a Bible study. And it scares me to know that so many people are leaving our building without ever 
being exposed to an invitation to have a Bible study. And you can tell, this three lesson series, this is the third one that we're on, is so easy. All you ask, to, ask them to do is look up the scripture and then read the question, that's it. And it directs itself. It's very simple. Uh, last night, my wife and I were out celebrating our 51st wedding anniversary, and we were at Applebee's. We went really, we really went to a fancy place. <laughs> and uh, uh, our waitress' name was Taylor, and uh, she was very, very nice. And we got to know her a little bit, asked her if she had any prayer needs, and we prayed for her. And she was so thankful that we asked to pray for her. And she said it to us more than once. And so uh, I left a card there to invite her to worship. And uh, you never know, somebody's gonna show up and they have in the past, people that I've talked to in restaurants. So just open up your heart, look for people. Uh, there's somebody else that I'm praying for. Um, I've got another Bible study I'm praying for, a young man that we're trying to get into a study. But I wanted to open it up tonight. Is there, raise your hand if there's somebody in your life that you've been praying for that you'd like to see come to the Lord. Do you have any friends or relatives? Okay. I think every one of us has somebody in our family or someone that we know of that needs the Lord and you need to pray about it because the more you pray about it, the more the Lord's gonna work on their heart. And there's gonna be an opportunity for you to make an inroads. As I said uh, before, uh, Louis and Heidi next door, we're trying to uh, take them out for pizza some night just to see if we can get a study with them. And then Dominic and Teresa who live behind us, uh, we, got a, we, we just made contact with him last month. So there's always people around us, whether it's a neighbor or a waitress or somebody at the gas station or someplace, there's somebody that needs the Lord that we need to be praying for and, and be mindful of inv inviting them. Because you have all kinds of things that are going on here at this congregation that you can invite them to and possibilities are, are endless. Um, you know, it was my uh, thought, and, and George Ann, you'll back me up in this, the more you go through this lesson series, the easier it gets. It's never easy, but it gets easier, doesn't it, George Ann? And, and she went on, uh, she and Stan went on a, uh, a campaign with us and we knocked on doors and set up Bible studies and once you've done it like that it's easier and easier it gets easier and and you think more about lost souls out there the more you're exposed to that kind of teaching so let's uh, let's go back I wanted to mention this to you here's a couple I'd like for you to be praying uh, this is Milena and this is Cain K-A-N-E Kane, I, I mentioned this before, is a National Basketball Association referee. In fact, he just ended his season. When was it? Two weeks ago? It was over? Boy, we're big basketball fans here tonight. Oh, okay. It was? Uh, anyway, he was doing the playoffs. But I want you to be praying for Kane and Milena because... They've been in my Bible study for quite a while in Florida, and I'm not getting back down there until October. And they need to give their lives to the Lord. And so do their children. Uh, their children are very uh, open to the Lord. Her name is Mia, and his name is Fran, help me out here. <laughs> At our age, you forget things real easy. Uh, we'll remember it later on. Uh, but it's a different name, but I'll get it in a, in a little while. Be praying for Cain and Milena because they're right on the edge. And we've talked about their baptism, and they say they want to get baptized in the Gulf of Mexico, so that may be where we baptize them instead of in the baptistry. So be praying for them. Now, I wanted you to look at your lesson tonight. So open your lesson, put your name at the top, and open your Bibles because we've got a lot of stuff to cover tonight in 25, 30 minutes here. So turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now we have talked about uh, the idea of learning how to bring someone to Christ. 
and uh, the power is in the Bible. So I always make sure that people have their Bible with them, whether it's on their phone or whether it's in their hands. Make sure they have the Bible with them. And it doesn't matter what version they want to study at, out of. You can bring somebody to Christ in any, just about any version, maybe one or two that I really don't trust. But uh, 1 Corinthians 16 is the first verse in the last series in this lesson, last series in this lesson that we want to do. So let's read together uh, 1 Corinthians 16, and let's start with verse 1 and 2. John, would you read those two verses for me? <clears throat> Okay, Ben, would you read that first question for me under that lesson? What were Christians in Corinth, or Corinth told to do the first day of the week? What were they told to do on the first day of the week? Does anybody see that in the verse? Give money. Yeah, give money, take up a collection. That's right, give. Uh, and you know, it's interesting because there'll be a lot of people that you'll be studying with and they'll realize, you know what it says to do on the first day of the week is give, and it says they, they gather together on the first day of the week to have the Lord's Supper. It's the same idea, same principle. And yet, what's interesting about this is people don't have a problem with collections. You go to any church, how often do they take up a collection? <laughs> Every Sunday, it's what, sometimes twice? Uh, or three times in the same service. Uh, people don't have a problem giving. And yet they, they realize that Paul told the church in Corinth, do what I told the churches in Galatia. Now what county are we living in here? Lucas. Lucas. It's like Paul saying, do what I told the churches in Lucas County to give. Galatia was an area where there were a lot of churches. So he said to the church in Corinth, you do what I told the churches in Galatia to do, and it's an order, it's not an option. He said, I want you to give, and I want you to do it specifically. Ben, read the next question. When was the collection taken? When was the collection taken? First day of the week. Put that down, first day of the week. And then, Ben, next question. How often were they to give? How often were they to give? Every week, that's right. Simple, isn't it? And yet, the people that we study with, we need to study this issue with them. I know it's embarrassing, I don't like to talk about money, I don't like to talk about giving, but they need to learn how to give. Um, does anybody remember how I'm teaching my grandson to give? I keep asking him, Drew, what are you putting in the collection tomorrow? And two weeks ago, he said, I guess 10%. At least he's thinking about giving to the Lord. I was so proud of him. Uh, two weeks ago, he put something in collection plate. I didn't see what it was. I didn't want to know what it was. But I was so proud that he's learning how to give. So we have to pass it down, not just to our children, but to our grandchildren. Um, you know how I learned to give is, <laughs> I'm dating myself. A long time ago in the 1900s, when we would drive in the car to church services, I would stand up, some of you don't know what I'm talking about. I would stand on the hump in the back seat. You know what I'm talking about. And my mom, I'd have the hands, my hands on the backs of the front seat and my mom and dad were talking and my mom was making out the check and it was $35. I thought, $35, wow, that was 1960. You know, that's a long time ago. That was a lot of money back then, 35 bucks. But I learned how to give because I was watching mom and dad. Now, little did I know, I really was in danger of being a human missile because I was standing up in the car. We didn't even know what seat belts were back then. Um, but that's how I learned to give. And I knew what the Bible said but my mom and dad's example was very important. That's why we need to talk to our children. We need to talk to our grandchildren, especially when they get a job. When he was, when he was mowing my lawn for $20 a week, 
I, expect, I told him how much you're gonna give tomorrow. And so he knew that he, I expected him to give. And uh, you just have to teach him. And that's what the Bible says here, it tells us. Now, one thing I want you to notice in those verses, if you still have that verse in your, on your phone or in your Bible, how did he tell us how to give? Read that verse again for me, John. Would you read those two verses again? Okay, it was an order. Do what I told them to do. I didn't ask them to do it. I told them. It's a command. Go ahead. So each one, he, did you hear the order? Not, you know, not just one here and one there. Everyone. Each one of you, every member of the church, do you see how specific Paul is? He didn't leave any room for doubt or any questions. Every one of you, no exceptions, every one of you. Now, the next phrase I want you to pay attention to, and this is something that a lot of people skim over, especially if you're studying with somebody new or a, con a contact, they don't understand how to give, what the Lord expects. Now, what does the Lord expect? Paul said to set aside or give every first day of the week, and there's a magic phrase after that, in keeping with your what? Income. Some versions say, the King James says, as you have been prospered. That's a very important phrase. Because if you haven't been prospered, the Lord doesn't expect you to give. Paul says, give as you have been prospered. If you haven't prospered, the Lord doesn't expect you to give. Um, so that's just something that I was trained to do as a child. Uh, when we first, uh, when we were first married and my plant, my steel factory shut down, I was making $90 a week unemployment while I was finishing my degree, and we put $10 a week in contribution at that time. And she was doing some babysitting too at that time when I was on unemployment. But it was just ingrained in me, you give. And, and it's something that you have to do because we're so thankful that the, what the Lord has done for us that we need to give. It's expected. Yeah, Ben? We've always given more than 10%. Uh, the Old Testament practice was tithing, which was a tenth. In the New Testament, it doesn't give a specific uh, number or expectation. So, but 10% is amazing. I mean, it's, a lot of people think putting five bucks in the contribution in the plate is big. Um, but and so they need to they need to learn. Yeah, back here. Read it for me. What's that? Read it for me. That's the ESV. Yeah, the first day of the week, each of you was to put something aside <coughs> and store it up. I kind of like that, that translation as well, because it's, it's, there's no set dollar amount. There's no set amount. Yeah. Just put, something, just put something aside. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of what helps better not. That's amazing. That's a great translation, ESV. By the way, Ben, uh, I have a theory, if all of the members of the church gave a tithe, there wouldn't be any budget problems. You know, there really wouldn't be. There'd be no budget problems at all. Uh, so a tithe, I always say a tithe's a great place to start. I really do. It's good. Yeah. I was just gonna say, you know, when we, when I first got a job and we first started making money, I always struggled because we'd always give at the end. You know, but I found it so much easier when you give off the top. Oh, yeah. You know, it's you know when you give off the top, then you just live on the rest. Whereas if you try to give whatever's left over, there's never anything left over. Isn't it true? Yeah, it's so true. That's a good principle. Give off the top. The first fruits, as the Bible says. 
Good point. Okay, any other thoughts, any questions? Uh, why is it so important to study this with, with people that haven't given their life to Jesus yet? I think, I really think that we need to let them know what's expected and what God expects of them, don't you? It's not easy being a follower of Christ. And you don't want to paint a picture, oh, this is going to be so easy when you give your life to Jesus. It, not necessarily. Sometimes when you come out of the baptistry, that's when the devil really intensifies his attacks on you. So don't expect to just, oh, come out of the baptistry and just kind of ease right into heaven. This world is not easy. And we need to know what the Lord expects of us. Yeah? Uh, based on what you just said, are you saying that you would hold off on baptizing somebody as long as they're willing to complete the study? <coughs> you know, that's a good question. Actually, I never... I never hold them to this and ask them, are you giving? I do that with my grandson, but I would never do that with one of my Bible studies. I allow that to be a free will. No, I, well, I mean, just from a like timing standpoint, do you say, mm -hmm. hey, it sounds like you want to be baptized, but I at least want to go through the rest of the study and complete the study with you, and then I'll baptize you. Or if they're really eager and they understand after study number one, like yeah. the first packet, do you baptize them and, and then continue on with the study? That's a good question. Uh, Mauricio and Diego, they only studied through the first lesson. Uh, Milena and Kane have gone through all three lessons. And I've got some other things I'm gonna, I want to show you next week, the next two weeks, of where I'm going with them next. Because sometimes after you study the whole series with people and you think you've answered all the questions, they still have a problem with going into the baptistry. And I want to talk about that next week. I want to talk about some of the excuses people have given me and how to work through those excuses. Because all through the series, I'm exposing them to the fact that the Lord expects them to obey Him. And just having belief in Jesus and faith is not enough. What does James say in chapter 1 of James? <laughs> you believe in the Lord? Oh, that's great. The devil believes in the Lord. It takes more than just belief to give your life to the Lord, doesn't it? Everybody shake your head yes. Agree with that? Good. Okay. Let's go on a little bit. Any other questions about giving before we go any further? Okay. Uh, I, you know, some, some people have problems with giving. And I don't have a problem with it. In fact, I think we need to talk about it with people that are considering giving their their, their life to the Lord. The Lord expects us and our wallets to be baptized. You know? Maybe we ought to baptize people with their wallets in their pocket. Uh, he, he expects us to give. And so that's what we need to teach. If you're going to teach the whole counsel of God, you've got to do everything. You've got to go into every area. But if they want to be baptized before you've gone through a series, I have no problem with that. Good question. Okay, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, and uh, let's look at what else the Lord expects of us, uh, and so we can follow along with that. Sarah, would you read uh, 25, please? Not, excuse me, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Okay, the Hebrew writers telling the church, this is the dispersia, all the Jews that were dispersed as Christians, these are Messianic Jews, Jews that gave their life to Jesus and believe he's the Messiah. And he's telling them, look, don't neglect coming to worship. Now, what do we know? If the Hebrew writer's telling them not to neglect, what are they already doing? They're neglecting, that's right. They're not coming to worship. They're not coming to the service. I'm always amazed at how many People give their life to the Lord and just expect that they can come whenever they feel like it. And the Hebrew writer is saying, don't neglect. The King James Version says, forsake not. Don't forsake the assembly. Uh, let's read the first question. Sarah, read that first question under Hebrews 10, 25. What does it mean to forsake the assembly? What does it mean to forsake the assembly? What did your version say? Don't neglect. Don't neglect. Do not neglect. That's what it means. 
Don't stop coming. Don't neglect the assembly. So does that sound like an option to you? Josh, does that sound like a, it's not an option, is it? It's a command. Do not forsake. Do not neglect. That's a command. This is not optional. Now, if it's, an, if it's not an option, then we have, to, we have to teach the people that we're studying our Bibles with that we expect them to be there. Now, what did I say last week? When Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, which we know is the Lord's Supper, then we have no life in us. And I always ask, in fact, I'll ask uh, Diego and, and Mauricio, and I, I've already talked it over with Cain and Milena. Now, they come all the time to Bible study and worship. But I asked them, like the study last week, are you able to come every Lord's Day and have the Lord's Supper? Because if you're not willing to do that, why would you want to be baptized? It's like a social club. You come when you want to come. No. The Lord's Supper is not optional. Attendance, giving is important. Attending, attendance, Hebrews 10.25, that tells you we're supposed to be here, aren't we? I, I want you to back up to verse 20. Uh, before we do that, Sarah, would you read that last question, please? What's your answer? That's right. I'm not doing God's will if I don't assemble. Now, if they, if they refuse to be here at worship and they refuse to have the Lord's Supper, I don't see a reason to be baptized, do you? I mean, they're not, they're not obeying the Bible. They're not repenting. Now, listen to, listen to verse 24. Back up one verse for me, Sarah. Why do we have to be here every Sunday? Read verse 24. And let us consider how we set up to stir up one another to love and good works. Okay, we have to consider to stir each other up to love and good works. That's why we're here on Sunday. It's not just to worship the Lord. It's also, according to Hebrews 10, is to stir one another up to love and good works. We're here to encourage one another and build one another up. That's what it's all about, according to Hebrews 10.24. So there's a myriad of, of reasons to be here, and people need to understand what a commitment it is to give your life to the Lord. It's not something that's going to be something we can just, you know, be hot and cold well, I'll go this week and next week, and then, uh, you know, I don't, I got too many plans for the next month or whatever. Yeah. You know, Judy? You want to walk in the light as Jesus is in the light. That's right. And um, commentator I was reading said the first sign of darkness is a failure to worship God. Oh, that's a good point. First John chapter 1, verse 9. We need to walk in the light, don't we? That means a lifestyle. That means building up a habit of doing the right things. You know, that's a good point. Say that but over again. People would lose because they stopped coming yeah. to worship. Yeah. You know, and it's, I thought that was really interesting, the first sign of darkness is a failure to worship. Yep. I, I can tell you, Judy, this, this is my experience. I, I can tell you, when I'm preaching and I see a family that I love, I may have even brought them to Christ. And then the next Sunday they're gone. And then when they come back the next Sunday, they're sitting there where Bob is. And then the next Sunday a roll back, the next Sunday another roll. I could see them leaving the Lord. They're leaving the Lord's church. You can literally see people moving back in the auditorium like, ah, you know, we'll run it at the last minute. You know, it doesn't matter when we, when we get there. And their commitment really isn't there. So you can literally see it in people and where they sit and what they do and how often they come. And, and their commitment gets less and less and less. And you can see it happening. Good point, Judy. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah, Dan? I can remember Dr. Lewis at the graduate school would always tell us that if I'm not there at the assembly, then that does not give me an opportunity to encourage somebody. 
missed, then yeah. I've lost out on trying to encourage somebody. Or vice versa, somebody encouraging him. Two Jack Lewis straight. has great insights, doesn't he? And I never forgot that. He was a man, very learned man, mm -hmm. that kind of succinctly boiled down mm -hmm. to encouragement. Wow. That's a good thought. Uh, Fran was, uh, when we were in Florida last winter, she missed a Sunday, and I was preaching, and I got up and I said, you know what, I can count on one hand how many times Fran hasn't been at worship with me on Sunday. I don't even think it's been five times. It might have been less. And we've known each other for 50-some years, uh, and it shows that she's committed. She knows she wants to be there. That's a commitment. So, uh, Let's go, let's go on to talk about this next issue. I want to talk about this next issue because he feels it's very important. Would you read that verse for me? Acts 2.42, please. They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Let's look at the first question. Read the first question for me. What does it mean to continue steadfastly? Okay, his version, I think it's the NIV, said, uh, make sure, devote yourselves. And the King James Version says, continue steadfastly. What does it mean to continue something? What does it mean to continue something? Keep doing it. Keep doing it, yeah. Regularly. You're doing it over and over and over. Steadfastly means immovably. So that version says, do this regularly, immovably. Your version <coughs> says, devote yourself. That devote means something, doesn't it? That's, that's a good word. What did they devote themselves to? Back up one verse. Read verse 41 for me, please. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. 3,000 people, in the next verse, the first day the church started, devoted themselves to four things. They devoted themselves. They did it regularly. So what does it mean to continue steadfastly? They did it regularly. They did it regularly. They did it regularly. They continued steadfastly doing four things. Now, 3,000 people did this. What's the very first thing that they did in verse 42? They devoted themselves to what? The apostles' doctrine, the apostles' teaching. That's the first thing. Did you know there's several lists in the Bible? And every time God puts a list in the Bible, the first thing he mentions is the most important thing. Do you know what the first of the Ten Commandments was? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's right. Wasn't that the most important command? Because if you don't follow that one, you're not going to follow the rest of them. The most important one was, thou shalt have no other gods before me. How about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.27? It says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. What's the first one mentioned? Love. That's the most important one, isn't it? Shake your head yes. <laughs> Every time there's a list in the Bible, the first thing mentioned is the most important. Go to Matthew chapter 5 and you'll see the first beatitude is the most important beatitude in the Sermon on the Mount. And so this list is, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Guess what? If we don't devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, we're not the church. I tell my students that at Rochester College. Uh, if you're attending a church that doesn't study the Bible, the letters of the apostles, the teachings of the apostles, it's not the church. Because on the first day that the church started, from then on, they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, the apostles' teaching. That's the most important thing. We've got to make sure we devote our life to studying the Bible. The second thing is what in that list? Anybody see it? Fellowship. fellowship. What is fellowship? What is fellowship? Someone describe fellowship for me. 
What's that? Gathering together, yeah. They devoted themselves. How often did they come to the gatherings? Regularly, immovably, continued? They devoted themselves? What does it mean to devote yourself to worship or the assembly? It means you're going to be there every time, doesn't it? It becomes a habit. They devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, fellowship. What's the third one? Breaking of bread, that's right. Now, was this a common meal? No. Common meals are mentioned two verses later. He's talking about worship here. Breaking of bread, not a common meal, the Lord's Supper. Now, and, and when people bring that up, they say, well, some people object and say, no, he meant the common meal. He meant dinner. And I always ask the question back. Now, did God have to tell them to devote themselves to having three meals a day? No, he's not talking about meals, is he? He's talking about devoting themselves to the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper. And uh, in our ministerial association, which met Wednesday and I missed the meeting, in Lincoln Park, there's about 12, 13 or 14 de denominations that meet together. And they don't understand how we can have the Lord's Supper every Sunday. That's just foreign to them. How do you do that every single week? And uh, they devoted themselves to the Lord's Supper, didn't they? Now, what did I say the people in Uganda, or I'm sorry, Ghana do in Africa? The women get up early on Sunday morning, they bake bread, and they get the raisins out, and they crush the raisins in the bowl, pour water in it, and then they boil it, get all the junk out of it, and then they have their grape juice for the, Lord, for the Lord's Supper during worship. So they spend a lot of time on the Lord's Supper. It's very important to them. Yeah? You know, you know what's not in this list here? What's not? We talked about it earlier. Giving. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's important, but they sure weren't devoting themselves, you know, they were devoting themselves to communion. Yeah. You know, these churches that are like, well, we're going to devote ourselves to giving. Well, have you first devoted yourself to communion? Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's so true. I have never heard of a church that didn't give every Sunday, have you? The plate's always passed. No, we, only, we only give on the holiday, but we oh. take communion every time. Oh, yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> That'd be an interesting church. That would be an interesting church, wouldn't it? It's so true. So, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's missing. The Lord's Supper's there. Now, what's the fourth thing? Prayer. Prayer. Now, what does it mean to devote yourself to prayer, Josh? How often would you pray? Every day. Every day. Yeah. What did Jesus say in the, in the prayer that he mentions in the Sermon on the Mount? Give us this day our daily bread. The Lord expects us to pray every single day for our food and for other things, of course. But yeah, devoting yourself to prayer is not once a week or once a month. And I always ask the guys at our meetings, because they're always amazed that we have the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Uh, you know, how often is enough? What's regular for your church? Well, they say once a year they'll have the Lord's Supper, if they schedule it, not every year. Uh, some churches do it once a quarter. And I always ask them, is that regular? Not really. Regular is not once every three months, or once a year, or once every six months. The first century church, when the church was established on the day of Pentecost, they did it steadfastly, immovably. They devoted themselves. That's a key word. So you want it, and I would never go that deep with somebody I'm studying with unless it's called for, because some people can't handle this, going into this much detail. But a lot of people can, so you need to uh, make sure they're, they're able to take this kind of a study. Okay, let's go to uh, 2 Timothy 2.15. Um, and, and let's read 2 Timothy 2.15 because there's a message here I think that Paul's trying to get across to Timothy. And he's at, Timothy's preaching at the church in Ephesus and one of the things he needed to do was remind Timothy what he expected of Timothy. George Ann, would you read 215, please, for me? Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. 
Now, what is the major, what is the noun? What is the subject of that? The word of truth. And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to do our best. Do your best to do what, George Ann? What does it say in that verse? Present yourself to God. Present yourself to God, approved unto God. Some versions say study to show yourself approved unto God. Devote yourself. Uh, read the question now for me. Why are we to study? Why are we to study? To show ourselves what? Approved by God. We can't be approved by God if we're not studying. Why? To rightly handle the word of God. That's what it says at the end. We have to study it to know how to handle it. Next question. Georgia? Can we be an acceptable Christian if we don't study to know God's will? No, no we can't. And that's why before, usually before I baptize someone, I'll ask them, are you willing to study the Word of God? Because I tell every one of them, I used to tell them, I'm going to study with you for four years. Now it's five years. <laughs> In fact, the police officer I have a Bible study with, he keeps reminding me, remember, five years, five years. I said, I know, five years we're going to be studying because they need to be grounded in the Word of God. Just get them into the Word of God every week for at least five years. I mean, that's, at, at that point, they're getting, they'll be addicted to Bible study by five years anyway. They won't miss. So uh, we can't be an acceptable Christian if we don't study. So we have to commit ourselves. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. Now Paul's writing this letter from jail, of course. And uh, he's in the Memertine prison. If you ever get to go to Italy and you go to Rome, you walk down. And, and on the left is the Hippodrome where they had the chariot races. And if you go off to the right, there's the Memertine prison where Paul was imprisoned in Rome. And you literally get to go down into the dungeon uh, where he was imprisoned. And uh, this is where he was writing this letter. So let's read this, this letter together. Josh, would you read that for me, please? Philippians 1.9. Sure. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. Okay. Uh, and the question is, what does it mean to abound yet more and more? He says, I'm praying that you will abound more and more. What does, that word, what does that phrase mean? Anybody know? What does it mean to abound in something? Yeah, to grow. Put the word grow. What does it mean to abound yet more and more? It means to grow. And then the next question is, what are we to grow in spiritually? He tells us two things. Josh just read them. What are the two things at the end of that verse that we're supposed to grow in? Knowledge and judgment and in depth of insight. That's right. Some versions say depth of insight. So knowledge and wisdom. What's the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Is there any difference? Yeah. Knowledge is book smarts and wisdom or discernment is how to use it. Exactly. Knowledge is book smart. But how do we use that book smarts? I know a lot of people with PhDs that they don't have a lick of common sense and not much wisdom at all. So he, Paul's saying, I want you to grow spiritually. I want you to grow in knowledge and in wisdom. Now, is that optional? He's praying for him, isn't he? Yeah. I've always kind of viewed knowledge and wisdom as knowledge is more instant learning, wisdom is more experiences. Yeah, good. It's more of learning books. And experience, life experience is more of wisdom. That's right. Good point. So Paul's praying for them. Wouldn't you love to have Paul pray for you? I would love that, wouldn't you? To hear that. Hey, I'm praying for you. And we're to grow in knowledge. And in, oh, we got it. We're almost done here. Hold on. Let's get down here. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. Let's do that quickly. We've got to talk about prayer. And we'll, we'll uh, start there next week, too. But let's talk about prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. Now, let's, let's look at this to examine what Paul's talking about in prayer, okay? Uh, Judy, would you read um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18? Listen to what Paul says to the church in Thessalonica. We pray continually 
Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Okay, now, I want to ask a question. This is nothing against Paul, nothing against the Holy Spirit, which wrote these words for us. But is it possible to pray continually? Don't we have to sleep? Don't we have to take garbage out? I guess you can pray while you're taking the garbage out. <laughs> don't, don't we have to drive the car? Don't pray when you're driving the car and close your eyes. You can leave your eyes open and pray, okay? But, you know, he doesn't mean to pray 24-7. He's saying always be in a spirit where you can drop to your knees or stop and pray. Always be in the frame of mind. I used to tell this to my kids when I was coaching basketball. I'd say, sometimes they get so angry at the other team and they were, you know, they were playing dirty or something. I said, listen, if that's where you're going to play, I don't even want to play this game. You get your heads on straight, get a good attitude, be positive. And they loved me for it because they knew the most important thing was not to win the ball game. It was to keep your attitude and your temper. That was more important. And they realized there's something more important than the ball game and the score. At least some of them did. Others didn't. Let's look at the question now. Read the question for me. Judy? What does it mean to pray without ceasing? What does that mean to pray without ceasing? If it's not 24-7, what does it mean? He's using hyperbole. He's telling you to do something we can't do. You can't pray when you're sleeping. It's an impossibility. What does he mean? Yeah, George Ann? Yeah, always be ready to pray. Pray all the time. You know, that's just something I really come in. I thought about this yesterday. I'm thinking, I thought, you know, there are times where I don't pray before I go to sleep and when I get up in the morning, and I'm falling down in that. I've got to get back into that habit of praying more and more instead of less and less. Um, I was in a business meeting uh, we're over time, I'm sorry. I was in a business meeting and one of the deacons said, hey, why don't we combine the opening prayer before we sing and the, op and the prayer after we sing three songs. Let's combine them so we'll just have one prayer. <laughs> one of the old elders, I'll never forget him, he said, look, we're here to pray more, not pray less. And he said, we'll never get rid of having prayers in worship. We're never going to combine prayers so we can have less prayer. And I thought, I was so glad he said that. I'm telling you, I love that man for what he said. So, yeah, that's what, that's what prayer is all about. In what circumstances are we to give thanks? All. all. Put down all. We're done. Uh, we're, next week, we're going to talk about singing in worship. We're going to talk about uh, the kind of life we have to live and then do a review and end the series. And then I'm going to have something special for the next week that I want to share with you. Some personal experiences in Bible studies and bringing people to Christ that uh, will help you in your Bible studies. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this time together. I ask you to bless all of us. Father, we're praying for Taylor and other people in our lives, Justin and Cheyenne and others, that we need to be praying for. We ask you to work on their hearts. We're asking that the Bible will Prick them and cut their hearts so that they'll be thinking about spiritual matters. Bless us each week as we study together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.